see from her setting, she's a clinician and she's um, working in oncology at the moment, um, but she's also a researcher who's based at the School of Pharmacy, specifically the Charles Perkins Centre at the University of Sydney. And she's also affiliated with the Centre for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado. So I might just ask people to keep stay on mute if you could. Thank you. Um, so just as a bit of background to Lisa, so Lisa undertook um, her PhD in the field of the ethical analysis of breast cancer screening in Australia with a view to inform policy. And she's um, conducted research on a wide range of topics. I actually looked at her publications and realised that um, in 2011, she Lisa published on the topic of biobanking in that she talked about um, the use of human tissue and when we need consent. So that was <laughs> probably a little while ago, but it's great to see that you have, um, you know, you've, you've, you've published in something that's relevant to biobanking, but Lisa has published on a lot of topics. Um, she's published recently on COVID-19 misinformation and people's attitude towards that. Her research has um, considered uh, the issue of patient groups and their, um, the interactions between patient groups and industry. She's carried out research on mental health apps and privacy considerations. Um, really a, a huge range of topics, but today she's going to be talking about uh, research fraud. And I guess that's probably the ultimate threat to research quality um, when unfortunately research is not genuine but fake. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Lisa, Lisa today to talk to us about how to be a research detective screening studies for fake research. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks so much, Jenny. Thank you for the introduction. Yes, as uh, Jenny said, a lot of my research work has focused on use of evidence and or values in health care provision and health services and health policy. So certainly um, I think the issue of fraud fits nicely into the kind of use of ethics and values in, <laughs> in health research. So uh, certainly an area that uh, I'm very interested in. Of course, um, sparked by Jenny's wonderful work in this area, as I might touch on a bit later on. So heads up, Jenny, that you might come up in some of my slides. Um, just uh, to let you know that um, the vagaries of teams is sometimes a little bit beyond me, so I might be relying on Jenny to let me know if there's a comment in the chat, because I don't think I can get my chat up at the same time as sharing my screen. So anyway, we'll see how we go with that. All right, so let me share my screen. Yep, that's looking good. Good. I think, um, I think you can see my notes, can you? So I might swap over. Is that better? Just getting a proper screen now. Uh, yep, but just so we can see the presentation mode. That, does that mean you're seeing my notes or just the? No, we're seeing this. We're seeing the first slide and then the other, the list of slides down the left. Oh, I don't know how to get rid of that. Okay, I might just briefly stop, stop sharing because I'm not seeing that, and then I can. Yeah, look, there's no hurry. We've got plenty start of time. Again. Is that better? Oh, uh, can't can't see the slides at the moment. We can. Yeah, look, it was wor it was working like just before. <laughs> what a temperamental beast. It'll be fine. It'll it'll be fine. Okay. Uh, where's Zoom when you need it? <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. Yeah, we use Teams in health. I know. I know. There we are. We can see your. We can see your sort of. Um, Desktop. Now we can see the. Yep, it's looking beautiful. Looks great. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Patience, everyone. Okay. So um, this study, uh, well, this topic that I'm going to talk about, is informed by um, some work that I've been doing with collaborators listed here. So um, Lisa Barrow in the US, who many of you will know, works a lot in Cochrane, and Stephanie Borton in the UK, who also works with Cochrane, and Rosa Lawrence, who uh, works in the US with Lisa. So the four of us have been doing uh, a study looking at research fraud and warning signs of research fraud, and that's really the basis of what I'm going to talk to you about today. So uh, thank you all for coming. 
coming along. And uh, just some uh, some grants um, and acknowledgements. So um, the, the work that I did was supported by uh, a grant from of Lisa's from the NHMRC, and Lisa also gets um, funding to her university from Cochrane, and so does Stephanie. All right, so I suspect many of you um, were familiar with the Surgisphere scandal that kind of came out of 2020 when uh, we had a lot of um, concerns about treating. Uh, can I just make a quick comment? Sorry, I'm getting a bit of noise. I don't know if anyone is, maybe we can all get you to mute. So um, the, in, in 2020, The Lancet published a big paper um, which we, where the authors were analysing uh, uh, tens of thousands of patients' data all about the use of chloroquine in treating um, COVID. And uh, the data um, was, was said to come from countries all around the world, hospitals in many countries all around the world. Um, but subsequently, um, a number of investigative journalists, including a very enterprising investigative journalist here in Australia, Melissa Davey, um, did a bit of digging into the company that was providing the data. And it really seemed likely that um, that company had probably just made up quite a lot of the data because there were certainly hospitals that didn't seem to be able to have well, said they didn't provide the data that, um, that Surgisphere claimed it had used. So the, the big studies that had, had caused such a huge um, interest around the world uh, were retracted from the, these very high profile journals. Seemingly um, a very big case of research fraud. Uh, and the other, I suppose, big uh, area of research fraud that uh, caught my eye was, was back in 2015, 2016, when um, this very eagle-eyed uh, researcher, Jenny Byrne, when she was back at Westmead, um, found a whole bunch of studies that were reporting on um, some fairly obscure genes that she'd worked on many years ago. And it seemed that these studies had links um, to each other um, in terms of style and format and method, but, but it, the authorships have links and it, and it seemed likely that this was a case of uh, paper mill fraud where um, external third parties had written papers, uh, cut and paste data from elsewhere um, and put them up for sale for um, people to buy in order to bolster their publication record. So certainly an area that um, is uh, perhaps growing in recognition and becoming increasingly of concern in the research world. It seems that research fraud is not actually rare. Uh, we'd like to think it is, but I suspect, um, and the data shows that it's really not rare. So um, scientists suggest that about 14% of their colleagues have fabricated, falsified or significantly altered their data, which is a pretty extraordinary high number when you think about it. Um, and last year, Carlisle published uh, a review of a whole bunch of um, uh, studies that had been submitted to a journal that he's editor of, Anesthesia, and he suggested that nearly half of the studies that he was able to examine um, contained false data. And again, that 14% figure containing so many that they were really just you know, nonsensical. And we know that paper mill businesses are booming. Certainly people who work in the publish industry, publishing industry uh, have a real concern about the growing numbers of paper mills that they're starting to recognise. So it's a problem. What's, what, what is the problem? Um, and the problem is harm to patients. So if, if these trials or these studies are feeding into, um, if they're laboratory studies and they're feeding into ongoing studies that trials that then may feed into clinical guidelines that feed, feed into uh, how we treat our patients, then patients are potentially getting treatment that actually um, is not based on real data. So that could potentially be the wrong thing, um, could be harmful or could just be lacking in benefit, um, but just very expensive. And, you know, um, in the clinic here, we use uh, evidence all the time. We use guidelines all the time. And the thought that some of those guidelines might be based on just made up data, but that's harmful to patients. Um, 
and the other thing is potentially reduced trust in science. Um, no, I think we've already seen with the COVID pandemic a huge issue with trust in um, the, the world of research and science. And really, I think it's important that we um, take ownership of this as a as a science as a as a, re a bunch of researchers. And um, you know, we need to prove ourselves that we're trustworthy. So there are lots of tools that look at risk of bias um, and internal study validity. So if you're doing a systematic review, you'll always look at quality and so on. But they all assume that data is real. Um, so we thought that there was certainly a need for a study that could look at um, how to screen for false data or fake research. So the study that I'm going to talk a little bit about for the rest of today is um, based on a bunch of interviews that um, I conducted last year and early this year. 30 people um, from 11 countries around the world, including low and middle income countries. So we talked to people with an interest and expertise in research fraud. So scholars, people who um, do systematic reviews or meta-analyses, people in the publishing industry and, and whistleblowers who, who um, have published on or um, commented on um, fake research. And we asked them questions like, when do you suspect fraud? You know, what makes you think this might be fraud? What are the warning signs? Um, what kinds of things do you look for? And what we found was that um, people had lots of different ways of describing um, fake research, problematic studies, and the elements within those. We found that they, they the way they talked um, described a certain number of um, types of fraudulent publications, and um, they gave us lots of clues about how to screen for fraud. So I'll talk a little bit more about all of those things. So what is a problematic study? Um, I guess that's the first question. What actually are we talking about here? What are we looking for? And really, I think um, there's no agreed definition and no agreed, agreed terminology. So Rosa in our group put together this wonderful table um, and the colourful ones are my sort of descriptors of, of what, what, what we're talking about. Are we talking about altering data or false data or discrepancies in data? And, and the, the, the kind of cream coloured um, word boxes on the other side are the words that people are using and they're all potentially using them in slightly different ways. So, uh, I, you know, that's interesting. I think it's um, useful to just use plain English when we're talking about fraud and talking about false data so that we kind of all know what, what page we're on. But inevitably with these things, um, jargon gets used slightly differently. But the types of problems that the participants we spoke to talked about seemed to be these three main types. And I'm not saying that these are the only types of fraud, but these are the types that the people that we spoke to seem to talk about um, the most. So they talked about t studies that are called tweaked data or bad practice studies where maybe a bit of data is omitted or maybe there's quite a lot of manipulation or, or subgroup analyses to get the sort of results that you want. And I think everybody is aware of that kind of thing. But, and the people I spoke with suggested that, that the, the kind of more extreme end of that would be, would come under the sort of false, fake research banner. Um, and then people also talked about uh, randomised control studies or clinical trials that were just based, just completely made up. The data was just completely made up, um, which is kind of extraordinary to hear. Um, so maybe the data was cut and pasted from a different study. Um, maybe the data was just made up. Columns of numbers were just made up. Um, so really just, just fake. And then other people talked about these paper mills that, that I mentioned earlier that Jenny had um, spoken on and has published on. So paper mills um, are from a third party, a commercial enterprise. Um, someone described it as like organised crime. So papers are just put together, um, again, sort of made up, cut and pasted from various places uh, and then available for sale. People can just buy them and uh, you might be able to buy not only the paper, but also um, suggested peer reviewers who might be fake peer reviewers. So that makes it more likely for your um, manuscript when you submit that to get published in the journal that you're submitting it to. And again, I think uh, from the experts that I spoke with, there really is a big need for an easy to use validated screening method that can help readers um, 
just general readers, people who are doing reviews, systematic reviews, peer reviewers, people in the publishing industry, editors. How can we look, what, what are the early warning signs? What makes us think um, about fraud? How can we kind of start that journey of thinking about it? Um, and then after thinking about it, if we get some um, flags, then further investigation would be needed. So what I'm going to concentrate on for the rest of today is the kinds of checklist uh, items that would be on a, on a kind of fairly brief and easy to use screen um, of either a submitted manuscript if you're in, an editor or a peer reviewer or a published manuscript if you're a reader or a systematic reviewer or so on. So both of those groups have slightly different needs and would look, be looking for slightly different things, um, but I'm going to talk sort of generally across both of those areas um, today. So these are the kinds of things that we thought, um, that we drew from our experts um, would be useful early warning signs. And I'll go through them. If, if, let me know, um, Jenny, maybe um, let me know if you want more detail. Um, but there were some really interesting things that I didn't think of and hadn't heard of that we heard from our, our expert participants. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that to give you some idea of the kinds of things you might look for when you're reading. This initial screen um, would be something that you could do just by essentially just by reading the paper um, without really having to go in any depth to get more information. So the first thing is alerts. So basically, I think my advice would be to arm yourself with a bit of software to help. So um, if you're in the publishing industry, you might need to purchase some software. Um, and if you're a peer reviewer or a systematic reviewer, you can sign up to alerts from um, things like Pub Peer or Retraction Watch, and they can give you something that plugs into your reference manager or your um, some of the major web browsers. And then when you're reading a paper, it'll pop up an alert to say, actually, there's a critique of this paper on Pub Peer. Do you want to go and read that critique? Or Retraction Watch has done a comment on this. Do you want to read that Retraction Watch? Um, comment and then you can read it and make up your own mind whether you think that that's a valid comment or a valid criticism but I think a really useful thing to have that popping up when you're seeing these papers. So the, the publisher tool alerts might be things like um, uh, an alert that that pops up if one of the reference lists has been retracted. Um, it might also be an alert that pops up if there's an unusual submission pattern. So for instance if the IP address of the computer from the person submitting the manuscript is the same as the suggested peer reviewers. You know, that's a bit of a red flag. Um, you might buy some Turnitin software, some stat check software to do a few simple automated checks um, that, that can just be done without you having to think about it. And I think this is an area that people were really keen for innovation and more research to um, go on. And we've probably got a few people on the call today who are doing these kinds of um, ongoing research to really get these um, this software up and running even more sophisticated um, types of, of checks that can happen in the background. So I think alerts are certainly something to arm yourself with and to find out a little bit about. Uh, the next screening kind of item would be have a look at the journal. Is it um, a so-called predatory or low quality journal? Does it appear on Beale's list? Um, you know, uh, is it a journal where there have been a lot of paper mill um, fraud um, thing, detections in you know, recent times? So certainly that's something also to, to just keep in the back of your mind. Have a look at the authors, particularly if you're the publishing industry. Have a look at um, what's happening in the background there with authorship changes. So a red flag might be if you get multiple requests for authorship changes. And, and potentially the kinds of things I heard from publishing experts was, you know, you get request after request after request, and by the end of it, um, the authorship team is completely different to the original. So maybe the original submitting authorship team was just made up names and then by the end somebody's bought the paper and their names are on the paper and they want it on their publication list. So that's a bit of a red flag if that kind of thing is happening. Um, other things that I heard about were um, the name of the corresponding author might change but the email address stays the same, also a bit of a flag. 
Um, so there's a few things to look out for. And this is mainly uh, at the publishing industry level or the editor level. Um, once the paper's been published, it's, that's not going to be something that you're going to look for. But something that you can look for, whether you're um, looking at the submitted manuscript or the published manuscript, is have a look at the statements. So ethics statements, um, trial protocol, registration statements, acknowledgements, funding statements. Are they missing? Um, are they really strangely worded? Does the wording completely not fit with the style of the wording, not fit with the style of the wording um, in the rest of the paper maybe? And that might suggest that um, things have been cut and pasted uh, one way or another. So another red flag. Um, and again, for the editors uh, or the publishing uh, side of what's happening at that submission stage in terms of cover letter, is it missing? That might be a red flag that it's a, a paper mill submission. Uh, have you, as, as a journal editor, seen a lot of similar submissions recently on a similar sort of topic, um, similar title with just a few words changed, same sort of method, same presentation style. Um, if you're looking, you might start to recognise the same topics being targeted by paper mills at a particular time if a paper mill's just churning out a whole bunch of things. And that might change, you know, over the months and years, but if you're looking for it and you're thinking of it in the back of your mind, it might be something that you um, are noticing. And then reading through the methods and the style of the paper can give you some warning. So for instance, have a look at the methods and does it seem completely implausible? For instance, is it just a sole author who's reporting on, you know, a multi, large participant randomised controlled trial? I mean, that just seems moderately implausible. Um, is it a hospital affiliated doctor with no university links who's reporting on a complex wet lab type research study? Again, seems a little bit implausible. Um, so they're the kinds of things that you might just like to have a bit of a think about. And really it just, it just requires you to have that in the back of your mind. Could this be fake? Um, have a look for details that might make you think, yeah, this is actually happening. So, but if they're missing, that's unusual. So maybe there's no um, region mentioned, maybe there's no location. This is a randomised control trial in a hospital, but the hospital's not named. That, that's a bit unusual. Um, maybe there's no study checklist. You know, usually we're all told that we should bring in checklists when we submit our paper, but maybe it's not, not part of the submission. And have a look at the style. So something that I heard a lot about was this tortured phrases. So if you are um, writing a lot of similar papers uh, as a paper mill, but you don't want to be caught out by um, plagiarism software, then you might uh, run an abstract, for example, through um, a Google, Trans Google Translate, and you might go from you know, English into Spanish, into German, into French, and then back to English. And by the time you're back to English, it'll be the same kind of meaning, but it'll be completely different words. And so that'll allow you to escape um, your plagiarism software. And that might be something like a, a conference submission or an abstract, or, or it might be a whole methods section or, or something. So, so look out for really weird uh, so-called tortured phrases and mismatching styles. I've already mentioned that the, the statements might not match, but also, you know, maybe there's a paragraph thrown in that just seems to be completely mismatched to the rest of it. And that might be another flag that either it's cut and pasted from um, somebody's own paper or some other group's paper, or it might just be a paper mill um, that's just randomly drawing things. Um, and the style might also refer to um, not just the wording, but things like um, the font, the headings, um, the legends of the figures, they might just not match the rest of the font um, that you'd expect on the rest of the paper. So there's, there's some other kind of little flags. Again, easy to spot if you know what you're looking for, you just need to have that checklist so that you can remember to, to look for those little subtle clues. And then have a look at the results section. So for instance, if it's a clinical trial, have a look at your baseline data. Um, maybe the participant details are just impossible. So for instance, maybe it's 
reporting on mortality and the, the death date is actually prior to the birth date or um, something very unusual like that. Maybe um, it's a, um, a study of a male cancer like prostate cancer, but half the participants in the study group are females. You know, that's just, just wrong. Um, so look for that kind of thing. Um, look for implausible recruitment numbers. So maybe you've just got a really large, a really big recruitment in a very short space of time for a very rare disease just quite implausible. Or maybe you've got a very common disease like low back pain that has maybe 15 participants. Again, just sort of quite implausible. Um, so look for things like that that just seem unusual. Um, and then having a look at, at your table one that's comparing um, the, the, the baseline characteristics of your study group and your control group. Um, a lot of people talked about this, having a look at those. Um, and there's some very simple things that you can look at. So maybe the mean uh, of the two groups is identical. Uh, maybe the standard deviation of a characteristic in the two groups is identical. identical. I mean, that is, is very unlikely. And maybe that's repeated for all of the baseline characteristics. And that just is a huge red flag, isn't it? That, that this is not, um, not legit. Uh, so, so there's a lot you can look at without having any statistical knowledge at all, just very simply looking at the numbers. And then look at the results. And that may be a little bit controversial. Um, you know, I think we're taught to say that all results are, um, should be included. But really, if you get a result that's so far outside um, the, the likely um, expected, you know, you're doing a systematic review and all the results are sort of there or thereabouts and you've got one that's kind of miles away, that's a red flag. I mean, it's not necessarily um, uh, the only thing that you're going to think about, but it would be one red flag. And again, what about implausible data, um, things that, that just seem to be really extreme. So maybe you're looking at body mass index and you might have a three month study that shows that patients go from a body mass index of 30 to 18. I mean, that just very unlikely or very simple interventions that um, increase your um, IQ by you know, 30 points. You know, we'd all be doing it if, if that sort of thing was available. So, so look for really kind of implausible results as well. So, so that's what we, from our participants, that's what we thought would be a useful kind of first pass screening. And after a first pass screening, if there are any red flags, what we would suggest is, is going to a second pass screening. And that second pass screening would require more information. So, for instance, you might want to look at other publications from the same authorship team. Have they been retracted? Um, are they um, subject to pub peer comments, um, so on and so forth? Look at authors, um, maybe their affiliation that they've claimed they don't show up on the web page of that university. Look at the peer reviewers, um, you know, maybe, maybe they're. Um, non-existent people um, and look again look for more details of those uh, statements you can copy and paste the number given for the ethics approval and if it, you copy it into google and it shows up with three other papers then you know that's a bit dodgy um, and ask the authors for the raw data if they refuse to give it to you or they make all sorts of excuses another sort of red flag and if they do give it to you then there's some quite significant more um, tests that you can do on it. Um, statistical tests, uh, you might look at images and you might get people to help you with both the statistics or the image review. So what we're suggesting is an initial screen, just using that data you've got, the paper you've got in front of you, and then if that shows up any flags, uh, a more intense screen that might require a bit more time and effort. Um, and from what we heard, um, from our participants, it's it's unusual that there's just one red flag. So that initial screen, you might think some of the things I've mentioned are pretty, you know, wishy-washy. Sure, you know, maybe maybe that would be in a in a legit study, and it may well be. But what we hear was that often it's multiple red flags, um, and then you investigate, and there's multiple problems. So th that would be what we're suggesting would be um, a useful way to do it: quick, easy screen, and then go further into something a little bit more comprehensive and time consuming. 
Uh, and I guess that uh, the comprehensive and time consuming end um, is often where people um, seem to get confused and um, there's often a bit of hesitancy around the statistics. For instance, people thinking, um, perhaps like me, that they don't have a lot of statistics background and they don't really know what they're looking for. But from what I hear, I think it's actually um, very simple things that can be done uh, just with a little bit of guidance. And uh, the tests are simple, uh, but the guidance is sometimes not that easy to find. So certainly um, the team that Lisa and Stephanie are working with, with Cochrane, um, they're very keen to put together some resources. And so we're working on doing that um, as well. And I'm also going to direct you to, um, oh, sorry, I'll just mention. So this is the, the Cochrane webpage, the Research Integrity Group that Lisa and Stephanie are a part of. And so um, if you're interested in this sort of topic and you're looking for some guidance and assistance, um, then we'll be putting more and more resources up on this web page as time goes by. And so that's something to keep, keep an eye on. Um, but the other thing that I will direct you to is uh, Kyle's wonderful talk that's um, here on Jenny's uh, seminar series. And he's given a really great step-by-step -step guide through statistical review for those of you who want to take that next step and investigate um, uh, paper that you, you suspect might be fraudulent and have some dodgy stats figures that you really want to interrogate. So I would recommend you all listen to Carl's great talk and Carl, shout out to you. I think hopefully you're on the call. Uh, then the people who work in publishing, um, uh, editors and, uh, and other staff members will probably all know about COPE, um, Council of Publication Ethics, which um, is uh, a bit of a an advisory board. They they offer a lot of resources for people in the publishing industry on how to look for these kinds of things and, and what steps they might take if they suspect fraud. So just for an example, here's one um, about peer review fraud. Uh, so when you suspect that, they, um, that the people who are suggested as peer reviewers are perhaps um, not actually legitimate peer reviewers or not legitimate researchers. So they're the kinds of um, uh, decision trees that you can go down to explore that topic in a bit more detail. And then uh, a couple of conferences, um, and I think Jenny's probably talking at both of these, I suspect, later this year. Uh, so good to keep your eye on these kinds of conferences. And then there's several publications that publish uh, a lot on these sorts of topics about research fraud, so also good to keep an eye on those. So I wanted to keep it fairly brief so that I could um, open it up to discussion because I'm very interested in hearing comments and your thoughts. Um, I do have some references here, but I might actually stop sharing my screen so that I can see you all and, um, and take some comments. Thank you, Lisa, that was, that was great. And thank you, um... Thank you for the the, sh the shout outs to um, various people. And I think Kyle is actually here today. I can see him in the chat, which is very nice. Um, so look, we've got some, we do have some questions in the chat. So uh, I might read out those couple of questions, but certainly if people have got other questions or if people would just like to put up their hand, yeah, please do that. Cause we do have lots of time for discussion. And I think this is such a, it's a, complex topic and I don't think any of us have got all the answers so I think there are lots of people here today that can probably make some really great contributions as well so I think the first I think there's a couple of comments in the chat um, I can see that Yannan mentioned as another sign a suspicion sign no loss to follow up you know in patient studies which Kyle Definitely, agreed yeah. That, de that definitely came through. Yeah, if you've got perfect data and you're following people for 20 years and you've got 3,000 participants and there's no loss to follow up, you know, that's pretty suspicious. So, yeah, definitely uh, that would that would be another flag. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is actually a bit of a philosophical comment where, you know, there's often, I think people sort of have this feeling that they their data needs to look nice and clean and neat. But in medicine and biology, you know, things are messy. I sometimes wonder whether we've got a full appreciation of whether we really embrace that, that, you know, that, that, it, that intrinsic, that like real data or messy data. Yeah, no, I agree. It, it's very messy. Um, and maybe in qualitative research, we're a bit more used to messy data. 
because there's always outliers and in fact that's often what you're looking for but um yeah maybe in quant work um people will expect things to be clean a bit more but i agree so i mean certainly this hasn't been an exhaustive review of of the kinds of red flags but but sort of covering the major groups that i think uh, are useful to go ahead um, and we're hoping to publish this with a little bit more of that comprehensive detail, that kind of really nitty gritty fine grain detail. Um, and, you know, and I think also if you're writing a screening tool, um, you know, you could use what we're hoping to publish and what I've talked about here as a kind of template, but you could certainly um, ad adapt it to your, your needs. So if you're an editor, your needs would be quite different to if you're a systematic reviewer um, or, um, or a different type of uh, reader or reviewer. So, um, you know, I think, um, I guess our model would be quick screen with what you've got in front of you with the kinds of things that we're talking about, but that's not an exhaustive list, and then go on to a more comprehensive review and then a deeper investigation. Yeah. Right, thank you. Look, I'll, I might go to the, the yep. next question, which is from um, Madhava Madhuredi here in the Biobank. So um, he's asking whether there is a, whether we do have a machine learning model in the medical research community that can classify as research forward, like a spam filter. And I guess, you know, this is very much kind of a holy grail. Yeah, yeah and I know some of the people I spoke to are really working hard to get machine learning happening. So for instance, something that might look at a PDF of a table and then be able to kind of spit out um, some comments about whether they think that is or isn't, uh, you know, look, and this is beyond my level of expertise, but I'm really kind of excited to see what might be coming out of that. And I know also um, there's a lot of, um, so Clarivate who work a lot in that kind of background publishing stuff are working really hard on these kinds of machine learning automatic tools around submitted papers as well. So I'm sure there'll be a lot more to come here. And I think that will help. But I, I don't think that'll, um, you know, negate the, the um, importance of having it in the back of your mind. And probably that's the biggest message here. Just be aware that this could be fraud. And once you think it could be fraud, then, you know, those red flags are kind of can just sit and simmer away there and you can look out for them. I think perhaps the biggest thing is that we don't even think about it. We just assume that um, everything is legit because that's what we are led to believe. It's not a topic that we discuss a lot. Um, so I really encourage everyone to have it uh, in their mind, um, whether or not they've got access to the machine learning tools. Yes, I agree. I agree. Um, so we have a question from uh, Pranajan, who's in my he's in my team. He's asking about predatory journal whether there are any biases, observations or limitations based on journal impact factors or, you know, quality or reputation. So did you, did people sort of talk about how they recognise predatory journals, I guess? No, it didn't really. Um, and, but, but it's an interesting topic. And um, in fact, I was criticised by one participant for calling them predatory journals. I think the recommended terminology these days is low quality journals. Um, but, uh, I think that is a really interesting area and I think is it Zach Munn in Adelaide who's doing quite a bit of work on this and um, I think he's published a bit on predatory slash low quality journals so um, yeah I think uh, interesting to, to look at that topic in more detail and you know I mean I guess the first example that I gave here the Lancet um, New England Journal with that Surgisphere data you know like they're big journals <laughs> um, so it can happen. Yeah for sure for sure. So I think the next question is from uh, Kyle and he's asking about things in your interviews. Was there anything, you know, like obviously this common themes and qualitative research, but were there any kind of big differences of opinion or disagreements where say one person thought this, but someone else had very different views? There were some, there were some. Um, uh, but but they weren't um, kind of big deal breakers, I suppose. You know, I suppose more that some people would say, okay, if I saw this, it would be completely, that's fraud. And other people would say, well, I mean, it could be fraud, but I'd want to do more research. Um, so they're, they're the, perhaps the, the kind of differences. But, but I think, again, most people said it's very 
really just one thing. It's multiple red flags. Once you start looking, once you see the first one and you think, oh, hang on, and you go back and you look and then you see a whole bunch. So it's not just going to be on the basis of one thing that you're going to call this out. It's going to be a whole bunch of um, warning signs and, and um, strange things going on once you've got your eye in anyway. <laughs> yeah, so no, there weren't really any big um, disagreements. And that was reassuring. You know, I think people were thinking about this topic pretty much um, uh, are aware of the kinds of things that, a need to be looked at and maybe you know some people might um, emphasize one more than the other but you know I don't I actually don't think it's that complex you know I think once you think about it it's kind of common sense really the sorts of things that I just talked about here it, it's it's kind of oh yeah okay well that makes sense you know like I don't think there's anything magic we're doing here I think it's just um having the thought in our mind and, and going through in a systematic way I'm a big fan of checklists um, and really just looking out for it. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Um, so we've got a question from Adrian Barnett, who's talking about the difficult issue of countries. So I think it's clear from lots of different approaches that, you know, particular countries seem to come up repeatedly. But obviously we don't want to in design checks that unfairly profile honest or, you know, genuine researchers from those countries. So mm. what are your thoughts about that? Okay, and maybe actually now this was probably something that uh, in response to Kyle as well as Adrian, that this probably there was a little bit of disagreement about this. So some people thought, well, we should just have big red flags against certain countries um, with certain topics. So um, things that um, are common paper mill um, issues uh, or common um, RCT issues in particular topics from particular countries, you know, that would be... Some people felt that that should be in a checklist. And other people thought very, very strongly that it shouldn't be in a checklist and that checklists should, um, I guess, stand on their own as a, um, you know, a review of research um, issues themselves uh, and all the other things that I talked about in the screening. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting topic. Um, it's very hard to think that you would uh, legitimately... Um, kind of flag um, people from particular countries um, because of what their peers might be doing in that country. Um, but on the other hand, if you're serious about looking for fraud and this is one of the big red flags, then, you know, it kind of makes sense to include it. So, um, yeah, I think that that would be something that perhaps as a team, if you were adapting a screening tool that you would think about within your team and decide one way or another whether you wanted to include um, a country kind of um, item on your on your screening checklist. Mm, it's a hard one. Yeah, definitely. Definitely a tricky one. Uh, look, I'll read one more question from the chat and then I can see someone with their hand up, so I'll go to you next. Um, but Karen's asking when considering predatory journals, again, recognising that that's a, you know, a tag that not everyone embraces. Um, is it about like journals or publishers? You know? So that also interesting question. And um, so I think um, from what I understand, some of the bigger publishing companies are throwing a lot of resources at this. So some of the bigger companies, are they have a research integrity team who is available for advice for editors from sort of the individual journals and that publishing company to say, look, I'm a bit worried that might be some peer, um, some, some fraud going on paper mill activity. I don't know what to do. And, and this team will help that editor. They have access because they're big companies. They've got resources. They have access to these potentially quite expensive tools, automated tools, turn it in, Clarivate kind of analytics, so they can, um, you know, that they can really work hard at that. But then I spoke to other people who worked as editors of quite small journals who weren't necessarily affiliated with these big publishing companies who said, well, we just don't have those resources. <laughs> you know, we don't have people to advise us. We don't can't afford those expensive tools. Um, so I don't know whether that makes those journals more of a target or not. Um, and, and sometimes it's about um, a, a paper mill finding a journal and latching onto it and then spamming it for a year or two until they wake up, the journal wakes up to it and then the, the paper mill might move their attention somewhere else. So yeah, 
it, it's a tricky one. <laughs> I think as an editor, um, important to have in the back of your mind, you know, am I am I seeing a lot of the same things? Could this be paper mill happening at, at my journal? Um, and I feel for the journal um, editors that are working with with fewer resources. Um, yeah, I, I think it's difficult. Yeah, for sure. I think what we've seen is that, um, you know, it, certainly the journals sort of describe their experiences with paper mills. Most of those journals have been with reputable publishers, big publishers, you know. Uh, so I think it is sometimes a bit of a case of the paper mills finding their way in somewhere and they don't really mind where that is. It's not that important. Um, now, I think, Joel, I've seen you with your hand up for a little while. So do you want to jump off mute and, and ask a question? Sure. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Joel. So once you finish developing your tool, um, have you thought about testing how sensitive it is? So here's one idea what that you might consider doing. So you take get some independent people who go to um, Retraction Watch and they select papers that have been withdrawn because of research fraud. And then they also select a group of papers which which are legitimate and you mix those up and then you send them to people um, to apply your tool with and you see whether or not they can pick out the ones that were withdrawn. I can hear a wonderful collaboration coming up, Joel. <laughs> but yeah, look, I agree that it would be really great to get some validation for this tool and um, you know get feedback from people on the ground who might be using it or wanting to use a tool like this or a similar one. Uh, and I think that's certainly what we need. Um, look, there are other tools out there. You know, there are other people who've published on this topic. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's probably work going on to validate or um, refine those tools as well. So I'm hoping that um, the next few years we'll see a little bit more research activity in this area um, and we can get some, some more traction and some more kind of refining uh, and evidence around the use of the tools. But I definitely agree that would be great to see that kind of thing coming out. Thanks, Joel. That was great. Um, I can see Andrew Gray has also got his hand up. Andrew, would you like to ask a question? Uh, thanks, Lisa. Um, uh, our group's done something a bit similar to what Joel just suggested and um, asked a bunch of people to fabricate clinical trial data, um, just summary data, and mix those up with um, valid data and had two or three people review those data using a statistical package which addresses some of the questions that you discussed, um, similarity of data, um, numbers of withdrawals, um, numbers of participants in randomised groups, all of those are testable um, using statistical tools. And the agreement, you know, we were able to identify close to 90% of those of the fabricated data sets. So it's actually quite hard to fabricate data sets adequately. But I'd be interested to hear from any of the publishers in the room as to how they think they can prevent some of this. And there are some obvious things I think they could do which include collecting raw data at the time of submission, so they're available for checking if concerns are raised, and being more prepared to ask for raw data and study documents, including consent forms, all of which should be readily available for properly conducted research. Mm. Yeah, they're great points. I'd, have you published on that? Um study you mentioned, Andrew, I'd like to read on it. I haven't seen uh, Not yet. <laughs> I'll send it to me when you do. I'd love to read that. Um, no, and I think there are many academic places to publish this sort of stuff, actually. It's not uh, as easy as... I you. <laughs> um, and your second comment about the publishers and how to prevent it, I think, is a really interesting one. And you know, something I was interested from um, talking to the participants that we did, you know, many of whom were publishers and many of whom were people um, like yourself interested in sort of trials and falsified trials. What I found, which surprised me, but kind of makes sense, I suppose, is that by and large, the publishing participants 
were very worried about um, paper mills and they were getting spammed with these paper mills and it was a huge problem and they were really putting a lot of resources and a lot of guidance around detecting and thinking about and preventing paper mills. Um, they didn't talk nearly as much about um, fake trials and, and I'm guessing that's because it's just less on their radar whereas people who are systematic reviewers or inv involved in that kind of side of things were really not very interested in paper mills because it's really they weren't really paper mills by and large tend to be wet lab research pa papers not clinical trial papers so they really weren't interested in, in that and they were very interested in these kind of individuals or or small groups who were potentially making up data so there's a bit of a disconnect between who can prevent it and what they're interested in doing, you know, and I thought that was interesting. I'd like to see um, some more discussions, as you're suggesting, uh, between the systematic reviewers and the publishing industry about that RCT topic, uh, and maybe some more research and dis discussion between the publishers and the peer reviewers about the paper mill, because I think there's a little bit of disconnect there. But yeah, if there are some publishers, I'd love to hear your comments. Yeah, I'm not sure. Do we have any publishers on online? You're very welcome to go off mute and make a comment or pop something in the chat. There's lots of things in the chat and I'm not sure that we're going to have time to get to all the questions, but just to sort of go through them very briefly. I think there's questions about um, one that we've sort of jumped over was being about, I mean, you talked, Lisa, about that sort of plausibility factor. You know, you see wet lab research conducted by what looked like very clinical teams or possibly vice versa. Was there anything else that sort of came out as being a bit of a flag in terms of not just country, but affiliations. Did people have views on that? Uh, affiliations of? Of, you know, authors, whether, you know, it's a particular groups of authors, you know. Yeah, yeah, certainly. You know. I mean, and, and what I heard was that classically it was um, people who were working as doctors in, um, in hospitals, um, like myself, uh, who, and particularly in China is what I heard, who did not, not have any sort of university affiliation that was was, was visible, um, but were publishing wet lab type research. And what I heard um, was that um, publications were needed to progress to the next level of, of, of job clinically, um, but really the, the hospital doctors just had no capacity to do that research either time-wise or resources-wise. And um, and I think, you know, interestingly, it's probably not a Chinese problem, it's probably a global problem. Certainly um, a lot of people also talked about um, clinicians, you know, in Australia, for instance, trying to get onto particular training programs and how are people who uh, select the candidate it's going to choose and basically everyone's got a medical degree and everyone does very well well okay we'll choose the one that's got a few publications whether or not that person's publications are you know good contributing to the betterment of research or whatever so there seems there was concern about this sort of use of publications as a surrogate for um for clinical quality and what that was doing to you know, expand <laughs> the, the number of publications out there that were just of, of limited value. So, you know, I think it is a big issue. I don't think we're going to solve it today, <laughs> but um, it would be nice to think about that. Um, you know, yeah, I can see that there's a lot of actually good value in getting clinicians who are using evidence to do their own research because that helps you to critically analyse other people's research. But, yeah, it, it's problematic, isn't it? Yeah, I think I've heard in the clinical community people talking about the fact that it doesn't make a lot of sense to be assessing people for clinical roles about something that's completely different as well. Are we selecting the best doctors, you know, through this kind of approach? I can see um, Lindsay's got their hand up. Do you want to ask your question? Hello. Um, it wasn't a question per se. I'm, I'm a publisher and I'm a managing editor at Wiley, so I just wanted oh, to great. respond to an earlier, an earlier invitation for comment from a publisher. You know, certainly at Wiley, um, and especially on our proprietary owned journals, we've been really trying to push this idea of um, editors deciding to adopt quite a specific data availability policy. Um, so whether that's mandated at submission or mandated at revised version, there are different ways of adopting that. 
one of the challenges that we've run into is around privacy, um, and especially for those journals that work to a double blind peer review model, making that, like, you know, providing a data availability statement then unblinds the work. And, you know, there are other additional privacy concerns. I think one of the earlier um, speakers mentioned about um, consent forms. Um, you know, and there's obviously challenges around managing that. So I think it's certainly something that whether it's a, um, you know, encourages, um, you know, a, a journal adopts a, a data availability policy that encourages sharing as opposed to mandates. I think we're on that journey and we're taking steps in that direction. And I think it's going to be an additional step therein to integrate into that, these kind of machine learning things that we've started to talk about, because currently, you know, requiring that at submission still requires a human body, as Lisa's been talking about, to go in and expertly assess that. Um, and that that is our editors, that is our associate editors, that is our peer reviewers going in and being able to make those detections. And I think that 90% um, uh, that, sorry, I've forgotten the earlier um, commenter's name, spoke about being able to identify that fraudulent data with that level of confidence. My experience in working with a large number of editors is that few would be able to replicate that level of confidence in having looked at the data and finding it fraudulent. So it's going to be about integrating policies and tools, in my opinion. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Lindsay. I was hoping you would put your hand up. I was going to throw you in it, but I didn't need to. You did yourself. <laughs> <laughs> now we've got we've just got a couple of minutes. Um, I think if anybody else would like to, you know, just put up their hand and ask a question. Very welcome to. I was going to do a little shout out um, just in case people are interested in similar events. We're launching a new seminar series at Sydney Uni next week and there'll be an in-person event and I'll put that into the chat. Um, we're going to have some truth in, no, trust in knowledge talks across the university hopefully coming up, which we're very excited about. But um, look, I think if there aren't any other comments, I'd really like to thank Lisa for an outstanding presentation. I think very, very, very useful, very practical. And I think as you've said, Lisa, the important thing is just to have the, the concept that fraud could happen in your mind. You know, most research is probably honest, most is genuine, but there is a probably under-recognised proportion that, that is less than that. And if we can all just be more aware of that through some of the tools that you've talked about and that Kyle's talked about and that, you know, other people on the call have also thought about, I think, you know, we can do better at picking the, the right kind of research to pursue for the benefit of the research community and also, of course, the patients for which health research is conducted. Um, I think we've just got we've got a couple of comments. We've got a comment from John about asking for raw data. It's important to check the CTR. I'm not sure about what the CTR is. What is it? That's the clinical registration. Oh yes, yes, the protocol registration. Yes, ah, and that yes. I also heard. Yeah, is the registration. So that would be a, what I would probably put into my second screening thing. You know. Um, if you've got a few flags, you go to sort of look for further um, in information and, yeah, check the trial registration and protocol and if it's a different trial or if, it, if it's very different, yeah, I would agree. That's, that's a, a useful um, another red flag. Yeah. Cool. And we've got one last question, which is probably, we probably need now to talk about this, but should there be legal repercussion for research fraud? That's a biggie. Oh, that is a biggie. <laughs> interesting. Um, yes, interesting. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Interesting. Maybe it depends on the consequences. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure that the law is all about consequences, is it? Um, the I don't know. We need the law yeah. is about. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, it's it's interesting, and um, you know, I think we put a huge amount of effort and resources into getting evidence-based medicine, but if the evidence uh, itself is dodgy, then uh, what's the point in having these amazing processes of getting clinical guidelines? So, you know, maybe, I mean, there are certainly big repercussions in terms of um, authors' reputation that are pretty serious. So do we need legal ones? I don't know. I'd be interested I in people's thoughts. <laughs>
that's probably a, a good place to wrap up. Still a lot to understand, <laughs> but thank you, Lisa. Thanks for your time. I know you've joined us on a busy day. And thanks to everybody for dialing in and for all your questions and comments. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much, Jenny. And thanks thank everyone you. for your input.